Um, our next speaker is the, have I got this right, the anti Malcolm Fraser speaker? <coughs> Yeah, that works. That works. Everyone will know Jim from his speech last night. He's a lecturer up at UQ and his book Democracy and Decline is available out the front. Everyone, Jim Allen. Again, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I agree with almost everything said. I should point out that uh, Julian is hoping to be pre selected for a Commonwealth seat, not for one of those state seats where he can go and fight the good fight. Um, <laughs> And I also should say that uh, I would probably agree with everything that Julian said, except that he's being far too kind to the High Court of Australia, and they're way worse than that. Um, so look, so a few basic points to start. Um, Anne Toomey sets this out, but if you look around the democratic world, federal systems do better. They do better economically in terms of fewer public servants per capita, and you might say to yourself, how can that be? If you have two levels of government, how can there be fewer public servants than if there's one level? And if you work in an Australian university, you know the answer. In the last 20 years, it's become ever more centralized, and the bureaucrats proliferate. I mean, in my university now, it's 60% of the paid employees are not actually in the classroom doing anything. Um, and so the more centralized you get, they just keep hiring. It seems counterintuitive. Um, you look at uh, New Zealand and the UK unitary, and you compare them to Germany, Canada, uh, Switzerland, so it doesn't even matter whether you have resources. You do better when you get the level down um, and you get actual decision making. The normal three arguments for federalism are pretty straightforward. You might know them all. The first one is the sort of Scalia argument, where federalism takes decision making down and satisfies more preferences. So the example he gives in the States is if some kind of prostitution sort of law, let's say it sort of splits the country in the US, 51-49, whether you want to deregulate or not. Um, it doesn't matter which side. If you let the decision be made at the state level, New York, California, Massachusetts go uber liberal, and the South and some parts of the Midwest won't, and you might satisfy the preferences of 70, 75 percent of the population, there'll still be some unhappy people in Austin, Texas, or upstate New York, but you satisfy more preferences. <clears throat> so if your view of the country is everyone should get exactly the same level of services, you're not a federalist. Go move to France. I mean, that, you can't be a federalist and think everyone should get exactly the same. Um, so that's the argument, one main argument for federalists, just you satisfy more preferences. It's got to be right. Um, the second one is an efficiency thing that uh, Sinclair's talked about. It really has to do with um, you know, your attitude to government, in a sense. If you think government normally gets things right, well, A, leave the room, but B, if that's your, if that's your general attitude to life, um, then it doesn't make sense to have two levels of government. You know, we're going to design a national school curriculum. It's going to be so good. It's going to be the best curriculum on the planet. You know, why would you have six jurisdictions making school curricula? In the U.S., by the way, it's not even done at the state level. Often, it's goes down to the county. You get, you get about 50 curricula. You get tons. And that's what lies behind the idea of competitive federalism. You have various school curricula, say, and I, in Queensland, the English curriculum is appalling. They don't even know who Shakespeare is. They deconstruct ads. But they, uh, they just happen to have a great math curriculum. They did a math degree. If you do uh, Mass B or C, and knowing how PC um, Queensland is, you'll know that Mass A is for the people who aren't very bright. Mass B is, you know, by the time you get to Mass Z, you're Einstein. Um, so, but anyway, if you do the good mass curricula, it is fantastic. Now, who would have guessed that? Um, and the idea of competitive federalism is people with bad policies, states with bad policies eventually have to change them. So we then come to tax. Australia is the only federal system where the states don't have income tax power. And it was taken away, and, and it's not just, as Keith said, it, it for all practical purposes. So yes, a state today could come and say on top of the 49% top margin we're going to add, but they can't really. And so some states in the U.S. have, they just decide they're not going to have any income tax power. Or you can live in California where the, you know, California taxes a lot. So you pay your set rate at the federal level, and then depending on what state you live in, you pay anywhere from 13 to zero. You know, if you're a sports star playing for a Dallas team, you pay no state tax. If you're playing in California, you pay a lot, so you've got to pay them a lot more in California. You might think, well, that's just Americans, but in Canada. You live in Alberta, you don't pay very much tax until the election Tuesday when the lefties might come in, which puts them to go up. Um, or you live in Ontario or Quebec, you pay a lot. 
we can't do that here. And here's the thing about state income tax. You get to keep it. Right? You get to keep it. You raise it, you keep it. Um, which is going to come up when we talk about the GST in a minute. So that's the second main <coughs> argument for federalism. Competitive. <coughs> Efficient. The evidence is pretty strong, the empirical evidence. And if you ever hear anyone talking about co cooperative federalism, then just go into the washroom and vomit and then come back out. It doesn't make any sense at all. It's not about cooperation. That just adds a whole bunch of layers doing the same thing. Um, and the third argument for federalism, which my colleagues at UQ or big federalists have, I don't share this view, but it's the typical one about how federalism creates more checks and balances and gives you more freedom. I don't really think the evidence really... I lived in New Zealand, and it looks as free to me as Australia, the UK. I don't buy that one, but that is a big one in the literature that you, know, you get these checks and balances. But I don't really think that's true myself, but a lot of federalists do, so I mention it. Um, so those are the arguments for it. Again, if you look and you actually have a properly working federal system, they do better economically, and they have fewer public servants. Right. So that takes us to Australia, which doesn't do things properly. And for all the reasons I won't go over them that Julian said, our high court is awful. Now, here's the irony. Canada federated in 1867, and some of you will know that two years earlier there had been a big civil war in the US. And uh, in the War of 1812, the Americans had invaded. And was, we fought them to a draw, so that's why they don't learn about it in American schools. <laughs> <laughs> also, the White House was from us burning down a and they rebuilt it and painted it white. So, you know, a draw is pretty good if you're Canada and you're invaded. But there was a lot of bad feeling. And so at the end of the, second, uh, the Civil War, there was this huge Union army. And by the way, Madison was a genius. He drafted a great constitution, but he was one of the worst presidents ever. He started the War of 1812. But anyway, 1867 comes along, and the Brits basically forced Canada to federate because for defense reasons. Can they defend this thing? So Canada had one of the most centralized federal constitutions, right? You get one criminal law for the whole country. Harper appoints all the judges. You know, he appoints the state judge, appoints all of them. It's a very federalist constitution. And the goal was to be centralized. The U.S. had a very decentralized. You give a few powers to the center, and everything else goes to the states. So Australia, we have the most American constitution in the world, probably. The most successful one. We basically copy the Madisonian constitution for federalism and bicameralism. No other Anglo Westminster systems have a functioning upper house. None. We're the only ones. You might want to move to some of those other countries these days <coughs> and you see how the Senate's working, but at any rate, we have an American system. And we have an American federal system. And the goal was to make the state strong. If you say to your wife, uh, look, you do the cleaning and uh, you do the cleaning and uh, look after the kids two nights a week and I do everything else, the assumption is that you're going to do something, right? As you do this up. If you leave everything else to the states, the assumption is, well, they must get some powers. You know, clearly, they were meant to have loads of powers. So here's the irony of history. Canada now has really strong provinces. Why is that? Well, every time the case went up to the Canadian Supreme Court, the center would win, and then they would appeal to London, and the Privy Council would say, no, the provinces win. I generalize a bit, right? Because you had impartial judges who didn't have a stake in the system. The American judges are centralists, but nothing like ours, right? Our judges have adopted the most bizarre, so they look at the heads of powers and they say to themselves, I'm not going to care about what the people who made the law intended, you know, because that would, that would mean you actually cared about who has authority and why they're making rules and why people should obey. We're going to read the words in the most literal way we can and say, is there any possible way at all of fitting in uh, you can't build a dam under the heading of external affairs because, you know, external affairs means you might occasionally make a treaty and a treaty might have something to do with this. And so, heck, yep, that works. Um, or work choices. Is there any way we can take the word corporation? And even though we know there have been a couple of referenda where the citizens of Australia have said, no, we don't want to give the center any more labor relations power than they get with arbitration. But, you know, even, even though that covers a tiny portion of it, can we find some way that the word, you know, there's a lot of corporations out there, maybe we give all labor relations powers to the center? Yeah, that works. I mean, a ridiculous approach to interpretation. That's what our high court has done. Um, and the tax pay, the tax ones. So we ha they have made it impossible for the states. Now, Julian runs down Tasmania. Very seldom do I take the point of view of Tasmania. But look, 
you have to have some sympathy for Tasmania. They're trying to build electro, you know, hydroelectric dam to build industry, and the center comes along and says, you can't do that. And the high court says, no, you can't. And they're trying to build a, an industry based on um, you know, manufacturing logging, and the center says, you can't do that because a bunch of greenies in Sydney don't like it. So I have some sympathy with Tasmania. We have impoverished them, and now we say to them, you've got problems. Well, they do have problems, but uh, I'm a little sympathetic to Tasmania, to be honest. Um, partly because of the record of our high court. So we then get to a point where we have mendicant states. They have no ability, really, to raise money. So then the GSD comes along, and as Julian said and John, it's a central, it's a central power, and they, you know, it's a, it's a commonwealth tax that they allocate to the states. Okay, fine. And uh, it's true that the Commonwealth doesn't take any of it, although the Gillard government flirted with putting limits on it. The Gillard government flirted with maybe limits. So in theory, tomorrow, the Commonwealth could say, actually, we're going to keep all the GST. But probably the political pressure would not let them do that. Um, but it's, you know, why would they have said yes to it? Well, they said yes to it because they have no way to get at money. In a good system, the people who raise the money spend it and they're accountable to the voters. That's not what we have in Australia. As Julian said, we have the worst vertical fiscal imbalance. And we also have the most aggressive horizontal fiscal equalization. So yes, Canada equalizes. We don't equalize anywhere near the way that Australia does. The Americans equalize a bit, but nowhere near like us. The idea in Australia seems to be that we're going to have a federal system, but we're going to then try to make every citizen in every state have the same outcome in everything. What an idiotic combination of views, um, if I can put it politely. Uh, and so, the GST was a way to get some money to the states because you can't only make so much money by having speed cameras everywhere. You know, but my view of speed cameras is, what do you expect the states to do? They're desperate for money. Um, so then you get the GST, and, and so far I've agreed with everybody. Here's where I think uh, Ju uh, St. Clair and I disagree. So the GST is this Commonwealth tax, right? And until 2008, 2009, I don't think any state had really gotten less than 80% or 78, I can't remember what it was. Um, it was a lot. Um, is it a good tax? Well, A, the states can't raise it themselves, so they have no, if they want to get a slice of it, they sort of had to say yes. So they did say yes, and it's pretty clear that no one foresaw at the time, and Howard's even said this, that it would get down to the stage where a state's getting under 30 cents on the dollar. The money raised by Western Australians go into the center, and they get back under 3 cents on the, on the 10 cents, 3 dollars on the 10, 30 cents on the dollar. Um, now that's really awful. Now, I guess where Sinclair and I disagree is Sinclair seems to say, well, they agreed to it. And so, too bad for them. I mean, there's a certain value to certainty. Um, and you can have that attitude. You'd have to go back to the 1800s and not believe in divorce. Um, because, you know, the idea seems to be that if you make a mistake, there's no way to ever get out of it. Because at some point in the past, you agreed to something that's really awful. And I think Western Australia is getting screwed. And Julian's right. They should be much more aggressive about it. You know who gets the greatest deal in Canada? Quebec, because they threaten to separate. And you know what kind of deal Scotland's getting right now? They're getting a really good deal, and it's going to get better come Thursday. Um, now, if Western Australia, and I'm not advocating this, but if Western Australia had a plausible separatist party, they would not be getting 30 cents on the dollar. I guarantee it. The evidence is overwhelming. They would start getting a lot more than that. Uh, and they have bargaining chips. You know, Western Australia delivers loads and loads and loads of Liberal MPs. They can put immense pressure on the coalition. And all it would take is for Barnett to say, I'm not going to campaign for you federally, and they're going to start getting a better deal. Who knows what kind of deal they've struck behind the, behind the scenes, I don't know. But the GST is not a good carve-up system for all the reasons that everyone else has given. It rewards bad policy. It's sort of crazy for me. You know, it's like having two kids, you know, Peter and Paul, and you say to one of them, you know, you've done nothing but spend your money on uh, gum and chocolate bars, and the other twin has gone out and saved for a bike, and so you say, well, I'm going to, so the one who saved for a bike, I'm going to take some money away from you, and I'm going to give it to the other one, because you know, I want to equalize things up, he didn't save anything. It's, a it's just a crazy way of doing it. Um, you know, South Australia doesn't, they, they don't allow, the, the states that don't allow coal seam gas, well, we won't take that into account. Um, and oddly enough, things like gambling, you know, if you raise gambling revenue, well, we won't, we won't count that, but a state, Western Australia, for, I think, moderately good reasons, 
um, says, well, you know, it's a call. I don't care if they have gambling or not. But if they say they don't want to have gambling, I don't see why that should count against them either. You just give the states the money that's raised there on a per capita basis, which, by the way, also is a subsidy. Just a straight per capita layout is still a subsidy because it's still, you're dividing it up and the less efficient states are getting more than they, you know, they otherwise would have. So those are all sorts of problems. And there's no easy way to fix it. I'm not sure I agree with Keith that we can, we can talk about this. But one of the mistakes in an otherwise great written constitution is the states can't trigger a referendum. It's a big mistake. Um, in retrospect, I think they saw the Senate as a state house where the, you know, the, the Senate can trigger a referendum, and the Senate would do that because there were, you know, people, there were MPs protecting or looking out for the interests of their state, which is a joke. Um, so there's no way for the states actually to get any of the cases they're losing back by referendum. So they're stuck. And it is good that Tony Abbott has actually mentioned the word federalism, which is unusual. Um, and he does seem to be making a few noises that he's a little more federalist than he used to be. But there's no real hope, I think. Unless the states get back, I'd like to see them have income tax power back. Because if you're not a mendicant, if you look at Canadian provinces where they have the ability to raise their own money, they stand up to the center. They tell them to get lost. And some of the biggest fights in Canada are a left-wing pr premier against a left-wing prime minister or a right-wing premier against a right-wing prime minister. You know, you, you don't care about the party link. You stand up for your province because you can't be impoverished by the center. But there's no way for the states here actually to run the kind of arguments that Julian and I would like them to run because they are so dependent on the center. Um, now, that's my optimistic paper on federalism. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you want to agree with me on the GST take and how Western Australia is getting screwed. We'll take those questions. And then if you want to agree with Sinclair, I'm not sure if there's enough time, but we'll, we'll see if we can fit those in too.